Welcome to the latest episode of Wealth Uncensored. I'm here today with my good friend and colleague who I've been working with for 15 or 20 years at this point, attorney Mike Abel. Uh, you're licensed in what, four states now, Mike? Four states now, Ohio, South Carolina, Texas, and Arizona, where I sit. That's Im- impressive. I <laughs> would never want to take that many bar exams. Uh, Mike's also, like myself, an LLM in international taxation. He's been practicing for 30 years at this point, Mike. 30 years, yep. And he has a very in-depth knowledge on corporate law, business law, real estate law, foreign investment in the U.S. Am I missing anything, Mike? Is there anything else that... uh... A lot of privacy protection and helping people out to solve problems. So that's what we're good at. So, Mike, today we're going to talk about this beneficial owner information registry that became law in, in the U.S. under the Corporate Transparency Act. For our listeners out there, this is the U.S.'s version of a beneficial owner register. So for most of you who are doing business and own companies and stuff like that outside the U.S., you're already familiar with the beneficial owner registers around the rest of the world, that a beneficial owner is a a natural person that owns 25% or more of an entity, and that that then needs to be reported with a government database and wherever the, the, the company or entity is located. And then if there is no beneficial owner that owns 25% or more, then it would be the people with significant control of that entity, meaning usually the managers or directors. Why don't you tell us? Welcome to the Wealth Uncensored podcast. Straight talk about everything that impacts your wealth. In each episode, I share what I've learned through my own experience and two decades of helping high net worth clients structure their affairs to minimize taxes, and protect their assets for the next generation. I'll also feature special guests who are experts in their own field, sharing their knowledge and experience to help you protect what's yours. I'm your host, Jimmy Sexton. Let's dive into today's show. Directors, why don't you tell us a little bit about how the U.S.'s beneficial owner information register works? It's a lot different than what it is in Europe or different parts of the world because ours beneficial owner registry broke it out into two different parts because they do not only like the rest of the world ownership, but they do control and management must be registered also. So the first thing you always do is you have to register the business. And once you register the business, where it's located and everything, and it always has to be every address you upload has to be a physical address. You are not allowed to use a P.O. box. They require it to be where an IRS agent can walk and talk to you personally. So that's the one thing that you have to make sure you're doing. But after we register the company, we have to look at first who controls the company. Then we look at ownership. And then there's a hybrid part between, you know, for example, corporation. They have mandatory requirement to go ahead and report on certain officers of a corporation, whether they do anything or not, whether they have any ownership or not. And that's any one of them that starts with a C, CEO, CFO, COO, anything like that. Then they require the president to be registered with the government entities, FinCEN financial crimes division. Then you have to look at your other officers that are appointed or even managers in some case. If they can make substantial decisions on behalf of the company, say getting loans, obligating the company on contracts, they possibly have to be registered also. We have to look at it. And this has nothing to do with ownership. This is all who guides the company is the first level that we have to report. Then we look at ownership. And unlike most of the world, our government made it complicated because ours does say 25% or more. However, that 25% or more doesn't have to be actual ownership. It has to be control of the ownership. So say you're sitting in a, a, a corporation or an LLC that has um, A, B shares. Your A shares are voting B or not. Well, say your A shares, they only own 1% of the company, and it's like a limited partnership because all the limited partners are on the B. So you'd naturally think they own 1%. They don't have to register. They do. They have substantial control over the business. So they have to register. 
Or if I have a voting trust, say I have me and my family, we all own collectively 40% in the company or even 30%, whatever it may be, over 25. And we reach an agreement that I'm going to vote the shares. Because we have that agreement, I am now a reportable person. Quick question on that one. So let's yeah. say, for example, it's, it's it's a voting trust. You're not a beneficiary of the trust. So you yeah. have no economic rights as a beneficiary to any of the distributions. But yeah. you're the trustee of the trust or the person empowered with voting the shares. Then you would be required to register because of your control, even though you have no economic ownership. Is that correct? Correct. Because you have control over those shares. You know, that's why it, it's not a cut and dry analysis, you know, on this side when we're over here in the U.S. Because they put so many of these intricate rules in that you have to really know on a more complicated setup who gets, you know, who has to be reported. And when we report them, we have to report their legal name. We want to, we always get a copy of their passport because we, as the reporter, has to make sure they are who they say they are. We have to have a physical address, a taxpayer identification number, either a US one, an EIN, or it should be an I-10, or their taxpayer identification where they are at. So we have to collect all this information to make sure it's correct to the government because they want to know where you are. You know, we also run into more complicated situations because most of us layer our LLCs or our corporations. You know, I should say go back quickly to LLCs because LLCs, I only recommend manager managed. I'll never form a member managed. But all managers, no matter if they own, have to be reported. And then we have the same analysis before on members of 25%. So let's say, for example, the managers on an LLC or before we were talking about like you know, the, the C-suite of a corporation, right? The CEO, the COO, mm -hmm. the CFO, maybe some managers or the president. So even if those people have no ownership in the company whatsoever, they still need to be reported as beneficial owners in the BOI. Absolutely. They have control. They want control and ownership, which is different than most any other places that you're looking at. They, they deal that those ma managers, even without ownership, have a substantial right to control and could divert funds or do what they want. So yeah. they want to make sure it's not some type of a nefarious entity is what they keep trying to tell us. I mean, that's a significant difference to, you know, the most, to most of the world, because in most of the world, you know, you sort of look first at ownership, right? And if you have people that own 25% or more, then you would report those people in the beneficial ownership in the, as beneficial owners and not sort of, the, the directors or the people with substantial control. You only, in most of the world, you'd only put, you'd only list the directors or, you know, the COO or C CEO oh. or whatever. You'd only list them if there were no natural persons that own 25% or more. So that means that the U.S. reporting is is considerably more complex and, and considerably more burdensome. Oh, yeah. It, it's a lot more complex and burdensome because it's not a straightforward forward analysis. And like we were talking before, you know, we have a lot of reporting issues that I have to analyze when we have those layered companies that I was mentioning, because they'll say, yes, it's owned by my trust. You know, that's owned by another company that's owned by my trust or owned by my foundation. And we have to keep digging down to say, OK, that's not the beneficial owner who controls it, who's the manager. And we have to determine a proportional basis sometimes that where we have one company maybe owns 55% of the company, the other 45, but then the owners own differently down here and you might have a common owner and you're doing calculations out just trying to figure out, okay, who meets the test? And you know, it becomes a burdensome process. You know, People think it's simple and they go, ah, I'll go ahead and do it. And it's real easy. And no, it's not. It is not easy at all unless you're just having one person that owns it and that's it. You know, then you go, okay, you know, it's only that one person, but that's not generally how it is. I mean, man, you almost so, need to be a mathematician to figure this out. <laughs> a lot of times you do have to do it. How does the BOI or, or does it at all? Does it impact foreign entities at all? It does because, well, if the foreign entity is operating and over here and registered to operate under here, it does have to still be registered. Plus, if it's an owner 
of the company over here, you know, you're looking through that company to figure out, you know, who must be reported because they're not exempt. You know, there is some different exemptions for large corporations, publicly traded and stuff, but that you know, is very few that are going to be there. You know, I was kind of reading through some of the exceptions a little bit, and it looks to me like you were saying like large companies, right? I mean, it's obviously like government entities are exempted. I think it was like public mm-hmm. companies are exempted, like yep. companies with 50% or 50 or more employees or 25 or more employees or something. But it seems like this reporting is is pretty much falling on basically small business or, you know, companies that are used to just own an asset. Yeah. Exactly. And and even some of the companies that are considered large companies, you know, in another country could be because to meet our large company exemption, you can't just be doing business over here and say you have 5,000 employees in Switzerland. No, you have to have 20 or more full-time employees in the U.S. that are located here, maintaining an operating presence here, and have over $5 million in gross receipts. If you don't match that, oh, you can't take advantage of it, even though you are a large company. So you better really start looking at this stuff. You know, I was already complaining about it when they were implementing this overseas, that it was, mm-hmm. you know, in most of the world, that it was complicated. But this is this is obviously another level of complicated. And I, I think that the real sad part about this is, right, is, is like we just said, it kind of falls on small businesses and, and entities that just own, own assets, which are kind of like the the least equipped to deal with it, right? I mean, yes. if, 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 yes. if you're a big company, you have a compliance department, you have lawyers, you have all these mm-hmm. systems to remind you of when you have to do this or that or whatever. But like, if you're a small business, I mean, this is really difficult. You don't really have the resources or, or, or anything else. Yeah, and that's absolutely true. You need to get assistance with it, yeah, especially if you have a foreign, any type of foreign component, yeah. because you know, I'm getting your state IDs and stuff like that that I have to maintain if I'm your reporting person. Um, so, you know, and, and it gets even more burdensome because the one thing that I'm finding out people don't realize that they're just even finding out about it, they don't know about this. You know, we're already coming up and pushing Jill. Yep. You only have till December to get this done. Uh, if you don't get it done, you got a problem. So, so that kind of leads me into the, to the next question, right? Is what are the reporting deadlines, right? Because, I mean, obviously, if I understood it correctly, you know, the BOI sort of came into force on January 1st, 24. And there's obviously a lot of entities that existed before that. And then there's entities that are being formed this year. So what is what, what are the the filing deadlines like like when when do you have to do this to to avoid I imagine there's penalties when when do you have to do this yeah. by in order to be compliant to go ahead and be compliant with existing entities if your existing entity was there before January 1st of this year you have until December 31st midnight to have them registered of this year tell- yeah of this year yeah I'm telling people do not wait you know, there's some court actions going on, which I could explain that it's a joke, but do not wait. Do not wait. Do not wait. Get them done. You know, I say if they want to wait till September, October, fine. But I'm going to tell you from my experience when we first started doing these in January, yeah. it was New Year's Day when it opened up. I was on there trying to do some just to see what the site was, and it crashed about every other time. It's government efficiency. So, by the time it is in November, December, they're going to have such a rush. You'd really want to be the one it crashes off. You know, it's not a thing. Now, there are different deadlines dealing with if I form a new entity during the year 2024. You have 90 days to go ahead and report that entity. Or if you make a change in an entity for this year only. The time frame is 90 days. So let's say you went ahead and did do an entity in January and then you reported, you know, changed some directors or officers because they left. Well, you reported in January, but you have 90 days from this change to report it in 2024 or you get fined. If I understand correctly, for existing entities, so entities that were formed before January 1st, 2024, they have until December 31st 
of 2024 to file yeah. this information. Although you don't want to wait until the end of the year, legally yeah. you have until the end of the year. If you form an entity during 2024, you have 90 days to register it. And then yes. if you make any changes to an entity that's already been registered, like you change a director or or you know you move or something like yeah. that, then you need then you have 90 days to report the change. Yep. And that's only this year. Okay. Starting in 2025, that time period is reduced to 30 days. Is that for registering new entities and changes? Everything. Yep. Okay. So any changes you make, any registrations, it's down to 30 days. That's why this year we've been a little bit lenient with all the entities we've formed, but we are taking the position starting January 1st, 2025, that we will not file an entity without having all this. Because the a really quirk in the law is our office files you know, a couple hundred of these a year. Mm-hmm. Easy. And whenever I, as the attorney, I'm working with my paralegal and she does my filings for me. I give her the stuff. She files it. This shows you how weird it is. We have no interest in the LLC. I have no management in the LLC. But we have to report both her as hitting the button and me as the attorney that supervised the filing. My personal information has to be associated with that company. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, that's just ridiculous. And so yeah. the government, that if you yeah. miss these deadlines, there can be some penalties. Yeah, just just a little ones. If you miss the deadlines and you don't do it, you can be fined $500 per day is the first one. Yeah. Now, here's where it gets even bizarre. Say it's a three-person corporation. You have three owners, two directors that are unaffiliated, and maybe an officer is it? Well, say that's three, four, five, six. Okay, you missed it. That's six people, $500 a day. That's $3,000 a day because you get fined for every one of them because you failed to do it. They have a right to fine you for every non-reporting, not just the company. Yeah, and then if they feel you did it willfully because say, like I hate to say my clients, they all got letters about this because I felt it was my duty to go back and do this. Um, Now that they have actual knowledge, if they don't file, they're subject to a $10,000 criminal penalty for not doing it. And they can all get two years in jail. So Jesus, with the $500 a day penalty per person that needs to be reported, is there any sort of cap on that? Or does that just run in perpetuity? It runs in perpetuity. Wow. Now, now, because I because I had read about this five hundred dollar a day penalty, but mm-hmm. I thought it was per entity. I didn't realize it was per person you needed to report. I mean, that's that, that's pretty steep. You got to re- remember the way the law is written. You have two reporting. You have the entity must be reported. Then you have the control people. Okay, that's why they did no limiting on this. So it's like that. That's what when they were first going in to establish this law and doing some of the stuff, I was contacting the IRS, asking them some of these questions. And they had no idea what they were doing. And they were saying, oh, that would have been a good good thing to do, but no, we're not doing it. For example, I have plenty of people that are in real estate and we do all sorts of layered entities, but the one person is the only one that owns it or their foundation. And I have entities underneath them and then entities underneath them. Their structure, I have a guy that owns Subway franchises. Yep. He's the only person that owns them. But we have, under the structure, almost 100 different LLCs for layering protection. They're all common owned. They all have the same thing in them for beneficial owners. So shouldn't we be able to mass report it and just do the block? No, we can't do that. You have to report each individual LLC, <laughs> even though they're exactly the same. So, so that means, so that means this guy has to file these reports for a hundred entities. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Yeah, and, and it's just it's insane. You know, you, you know, they said, yeah, that would have been nice if we would have had some subsidiary set up that we could say, oh, name all your subsidiaries. You know, yeah, yeah, that would have been nice, but that's not something we do in the U.S. Unbelievable. So. <laughs> What so what information I want to talk a little bit about the information that he's reported. So 
So for the company itself, what information needs to be provided? It has to be the name of the company, the EIN, the physical location it maintains in the in here in the U.S. If it doesn't, it's only foreign. The sole, the secretary are the their statutory agent's address here and the physical location in the com- country. Okay. So it's just very basic for them. What, what about for the for the individual, you know, owners and 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 people with substantial control that need to be reported? What, yeah, what information is there on their legal names, their dates of birth, um, their physical location address? I have to have a ID for them, preferably their um, passport, driver's license, some government issued ID that they have with that. And we always tell them we want their taxpayer identification number because it comes down that the government does not trust us, that we verified it. They can also be issues. That's now, why we're liable. N- now, I read somewhere that, that you know, the copy of, of the, the government-issued photo ID actually has to be uploaded into this beneficial yes. owner register. Absolutely. We have wow. to do that all the time. So, so... You know, because you were talking about like a like a change, right? That a change needs to be reported. You have ninety days to do it this year, thirty days to do it next yep. year. So does that mean if like anything changes, like the address of the company, like if you change your address, if you get a new driver's license or a passport, like all of that stuff needs to be reported within thirty days? You get married and you change your name. You have to report it. You decide to move. You appoint a new director. You appoint a new president, CEO. You know, somebody comes in and buys 25% interest of your company. Somebody sells 25% it. Whatever it is has to be reported to the government. You and I always tell people the same thing. Listen, this is a law. You got to comply with it. I've read some stuff on online and I've had a couple of people that I've talked to that I've told like, hey, you, you, you got to do this. That have basically said, well, no, it's been Ill- ruled illegal by, by, by a federal court. I forget where. And so, you know, I know yeah. that there's, there, there's some lawyers and advisors out there telling people, no, you don't have to do it. I know some people are under a belief they don't have to do it. And it's been ruled unconstitutional. Is, is that true or or is that just a bunch of nonsense? Uh, the people that are reporting that, uh, I'll say they're true that there was one court case that ruled it unconstitutional. However, if you read the decision, it is limited to the trade group's members that filed the lawsuits and only them. And the judge even put that if these additional like five words get added to the language, then it's constitutional again. And it's already being worked on in Congress. So I, it's going, it's going to be overturned, that decision, no doubt in my mind. Okay. And the big risk becomes, okay, fine. I want to be one of those people that I say it's going to be overruled. It's going to be, you know, it's going to be unconstitutional. And then I don't do this this year. Starting in January next year, say that decision gets overturned or it doesn't get ruled unconstitutional, they can start fining you immediately. Oh, it's not worth it. You know, I don't want to be going into an audit hoping and praying that it's going to be determined unconstitutional sometime in 2026 after I've been sitting in jail yeah. for a year. <laughs> yeah. You know? Or or out a whole bunch of money. Uh, out a whole bunch of money or, or worse yet, your passport you, you gets revoked, you can't travel anymore, anything like that. Now, I hate to say this, but I do not trust our government. So... Um, you know, it, it's gone off the rails with this stuff. And hopefully, you know, hopefully we get a new administration and they say, what are we doing with this? You know, I don't mind some of it, but the teeth that they put in this is a detriment to small business owners. You know, like you said, major corporations, no problem. They have nothing to really report because they're exempt. Small businesses, you better hope you have a good attorney that knows how to find these things. The thing that bothers me about it, right? I mean, with so many of these laws that they do, and I, I, mean, I think this one's a prime example, right? Is, I mean, it really hits small business hard. And I mean, small mm-hmm. business is already, you know, 
struggling to survive. I mean, there's not a lot of small businesses that are just swimming in money, right? I mean, they're, they're usually yeah. sort of, uh, you know, struggling, limping along, trying to survive. And and it, it's almost like, I mean, this is sort of the, I don't want to say the conspiracy theorist, but the, uh, you know, the, the untrusting person of the government, you know, almost makes me think that this is like the government saying, you know what, we're just going to do this as like an additional revenue stream that we're going to, you know, burden small business with, right? We'll leave all the big businesses yeah. that can actually afford the penalties and have the infrastructure and all that. We're going to leave them alone, but we're going to do this, you know, this, this, we're basically going to tax small business in the form of penalties because I mean, look, you know, I mean, if you're a small business, you have an LLC, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's a gardening business, you know, maybe it's a, uh-huh. an accounting firm, Hell, maybe it's a law firm, right? I mean, yeah. if, if you go get a new passport or a new driver's license, the last thing on your mind is, you know what? I need to go update this in the BOI. Yeah, yeah exactly. It, it, what's, it, it's so screwy because I think of little mom and pa, you know, they, they have a little money stand somewhere and they have a disregarded entity because it's only one of them. They never bothered to do all the formalities. They have no idea. They just have, you know, a honeypot sales at the side of the road. And next thing you know, they're going to jail because they didn't know about this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, they're, it's and they're not advertising about it over here and not warning everybody about it. That's it's ridiculous. pretty shady. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Now, I have one more question because just because when you brought yeah. up this, this example of the, you know, this honey stand with owned by an yeah. LLC owned by a husband and wife, you know, with a lot of the international tax stuff that you and I deal with, like controlled foreign corporations and foreign partnerships and all this stuff, mm-hmm. you have all this 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 ownership attribution, right? So. You know, you know, like, you know, with a controlled foreign corporation, if a husband and wife separately own shares, they're they're considered to own each other's shares. Right. So if if, if you know, let's say the husband owns 30 percent, the wife owns 40 percent, you know, they're each considered to own 70 percent um, uh-huh. because of the attribution. Now, is there an yeah. attribution like is there is there an attribution in, in this, so, I mean, let's say you had something where, you know, the husband owned 20%, the wife owned 10%. Are they each considered to own 30%? Yes. Yeah. Because they're going to take the attribution rules of the country or territory that they're in. The okay. IRS, the pieces that I've read dealing with stuff like this, they want over disclosure, not wow. under. So wow. I, that's, I tell all my people, I tell them, look, I'd rather err on the caution of I gave the government too much information than too little. Because they, yeah, if they can argue with you, they're going to argue with you. You know, they are a collection agency through and through. Yeah. This has been an, an interesting conversation. I mean, I know you and I have talked a little bit about the, the, the BOI stuff before, but, you know, I definitely learned some more. Um, so, I mean, obviously, I know you're doing a lot of this work. Uh how would people get in touch with you if they have questions about the BOI and what the requirements are? You know, if they just want you to analyze it and handle it for them, how would they best get in touch with you? They can either go directly from Esquire's website or send me an email from there, Mike at EsquireGroup.com or even my law practice, Mike at AbleLawGroup.com. Either one of them. You know, they got yeah. all the different choices they have. Sounds good, Mike. Thanks for Thank you for joining me and I hope you have a, a great rest of your day. You too, Jimmy. Thank you for joining me on Wealth Uncensored, where we help you minimize taxes and protect your wealth for the next generation. If you like our show, be sure to subscribe and leave a review. And if you have any questions or suggestions for future episodes, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at info at esquiregroup.com. And don't forget to visit Esquire Group's website for more information on how we can help you secure your wealth. I'll be dropping knowledge again next week. Don't forget to join us.